The Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the February edition of the History Speaker Series. Uh, we are very happy and grateful that you were willing to spend your evening with us. We have a fascinating talk tonight. I'd like to introduce the folks that are on screen with us this evening. We have Monica, who is running the tech and the Zoom. Uh, and you may know her from speaking with her on the phone or from seeing her at the museum at the front desk. We have Trish, who is the head of the history committee uh, through OMA. And we have our wonderful speaker this evening, Fred Blair. Uh, Fred is an amazing local historian. I email him with questions constantly, and he's uh, gracious enough to answer them for me. Um, Fred has written various publications on a variety of history topics, um, and he publishes his early settlers posts every Thursday through Oma's Facebook. Uh, so make sure you check the next one out tomorrow um, and uh, those have been published now as well through the OMA Press publication into two volumes so you can come pick those up at OMA also. Fred is a valued member of our history committee. He is the archivist at St. James Church and he is a 2021 Aurelia Regional Arts and Heritage Award winner so uh, we're very fortunate to have such an expert with us this evening. Um, without further ado, I present to you Fred Blair. Good evening. This presentation is about the Black veterans of the War of 1812 in Upper Canada. There are a limited number of surviving documents from that time period, and many do not identify men and women by their color. Black people were also adopted or enslaved by Indigenous tribes, and these tribe members may not have been identified by their origins either. It, ha it has therefore been difficult to determine who most of the Black veterans actually were. This is a work in progress that I hope other historians can use as a basis for revealing more about the role of the Black community in Upper Canada during this war. Most of my research on the war has been on the Upper Canada militia in which black men would have served and on the war last lost claims. There is evidence that black soldiers also served in British regiments as well as with indigenous warriors. Some histories had the colored cork of most of black, black volunteers present at several battles during the war, but documentation for some of those claims is lacking. During this presentation, I will be talking about the experience of several Black families. I will begin now with a brief history of the Loyalist Exodus North after the American Revolution and how these events led to the formation of some small Black communities in Upper Canada. Some Black families would arrive as slaves or escaped slaves, while others would arrive as free men and women. This will be followed by the history of the creation of the segregated Black company known as the Colored Corps later known as the Artificers' Corps. The creation of the British 104th Regiment that it recruited black men and some black veterans of the War of 1812. At the end of the presentation, I will talk about the militia land grants for war veterans 
and the creation of the Wilberforce Street segregated black community in Oro Township. Before I can proceed, you need to know, you need to be familiar with some of the locations that I will be talking about. The blue arrow on this map of Upper Canada points to Fort York and the town of York, which will later be the city of Toronto. The black arrow points to Burlington Heights, which was also known as the head of the lake. The orange arrow points to Fort George and the town of Niagara, now known as Niagara-on-the-Lake. The green arrow points to Fort Erie, and the yellow arrow points to the town of Sandwich, now known as the city of Windsor, across the river from Detroit. There were a, a small number of Black people living in Upper Canada before the American Revolution. During the war, the British had promised freedom to any slaves who served with the British forces. Thousands of these former veterans and other free Black people were resettled in the Canadian provinces to the north. Richard Pierpoint gained his freedom by volunteering as a private in Butler's Rangers. Richard later became a leader in the Black community in the Niagara area and served there during the War of 1812. Loyalists and Indigenous tribes also brought their slaves north with them. The orange arrows on this map indicate the Loyalist routes from between the Carolinas and New York and into the British provinces. Michael Grote, an escaped Black slave, is believed to have made the trek up through the Appalachian Mountains with the Tuscarora tribe from North Carolina and to have later settled at Burlington Heights. Some Loyalists who settled in the Atlantic provinces who received land grants that were not suitable for farming or that were too isolated. These families, like that of Peter and Sarah Long, both African Americans, later made the journey up the St. Lawrence River and received new land grants in Upper Canada. Peter had been born in Massachusetts, joined the British Army in 1777, and arrived in the town of York in 1793 with his wife, his two sons, James and John, and other children. When Chief Joseph Brandt of the Mohawks arrived in Upper Canada, he was one of the largest slave owners in the province. The last of his slaves were freed when he died in 1807. The Tuscarora of North Carolina had adopted runaway slaves into their tribe for some time and brought those former slaves north along the Appalachian highways to New York State and then to Chief Joseph Brandt's settlement on the Grand River. In 1785, a census of the Grand River First Nations recorded that there were 1,843 Indigenous people settled there. Of these, 129 were Tuscarora, and this included men who would later record their names as tribe members, and also in 1794, as Black settlers in the Niagara area. In 1783, slavery was banned in Great Britain, but not yet in the British colonies. On February 4th, 1793, George Washington signed the Fugitive Slave Act. Slave owners and their agents were allowed to capture runaway slaves throughout the United States. All children born to slaves were also the property of the mother's owner. Many former slaves who were living in the States fled north to Canada. On July 9, 1793, Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe passed the Act Against Slavery, which banned the importing of slaves and freed the children of former slaves when they reached the age of 25. In 1794, the petition of free Negroes was signed by 19 Black men. They were former veterans of the American Revolution, men who were born free, and other men who arrived in Upper Canada after the Revolution. They requested a tract of land separate from white settlers on which to create a segregated Black community. This petition was not granted. Some of these men lived in the Black neighborhood in the town of Niagara. Four of these men, including Richard Pierpoint, had served in Butler's Rangers in New York State during the Revolution. One was a free Black man from New Jersey, one was a, a servant of a colonial administrator, and little is known about the other 13 men prior to 1794. 
Some of Michael Great Grote's sons later signed as Tuscarora War Warriors on a petition in 1842. The petitioners included Richard Purpoint, Michael Grote, and John Jackson, who will all appear later in this presentation. In 1807, William Wilberforce was instrumental in the passing of the Slave Trade Act that banned the sale of slaves throughout the British Empire. Wilberforce Street in Oral Township, where the first official black settlement was created in 1819, was named after William. By 1812, black families were scattered, scattered throughout the settled areas of Upper Canada. From the 100 the, from the 1794 petition of free Negroes, we know that there was an interest in forming black communities and that there was some history of small groups of black families in some towns. Towns offered a variety of job opportunities. I do not know if there was a community in Kingston, one of the major towns, but we do have evidence of communities in the towns of New York and Niagara, and history suggested that there were some families with the indigenous tribes on the Grand River Reserves west of Niagara. In 1798, there were five men and five women living in Peter Long's household on the bay in the town of York. Having a 10 adults in one house suggested that Peter, a black man, may have been running a boarding house or an inn. An 1802 census for the town recorded seven black men, four women, and nine children, a total of 20 people residing in the town. By 1810, William and Benjamin Davenport were logging in the area of Davenport Station in the town of York, and by 1819, they were working as contractors in Simcoe County. The Upper Canada militia roles have been an aid in learning more about some of these black families. In 1812, a number of revisions were passed to change laws governing the Upper Canada Militia. All men between the ages of 16 and 60 were required to muster for militia duty when ordered. Some men were exempted as unfit, as providing an essential service, or for religious reasons. Where militia roles survived from the time period, the names on those roles could be compared to names in Black family histories of men who lived within each militia muster area to compile likely lists of black veterans. Other records sometimes also confirm the names of these veterans. In June 1812, Lieutenant Governor Isaac Brock ordered each local militia regiment to form two flank companies of volunteers who were fit for extended service. Some of these flank companies from New York to Niagara and further west would later be ordered to serve on the Niagara frontier. The volunteer role here for the second York militia recorded the names of 120 volunteers between the ages of 16 and 38. Only 80 of these men were initially selected to serve in the two flying companies and had an average age of 25. It was possible that black men had volunteered to serve in the flying companies in this and other regiments, but not all the roles have survived. Among those that have survived, there are men with the same names as black men found in other records, but proving that both sets of records were for the same man has sometimes been difficult. The creation of special companies like the flank and rifle companies and cavalry units within the militia regiments suggested that the British Army might accept the idea of a segregated black militia unit that would recruit from the black communities in York and in Niagara. On June 18, 1812, the American president, James Madison, declared war against the British. Preparations were made to invade the Canadian provinces to the north. Riders took a few days to deliver the news to Niagara. On July 2nd, 1812, the flying companies from York, the Niagara area, and further west were ordered to march to Fort George on the Niagara River. They would serve in four divisions along the river. On June 12th, 1812, Brigadier General William Hall invaded Sandwich, now part of Windsor, Ontario, with his American army. 
Major General Isaac Brock requested militia volunteers to accompany him west on his, with his British regulars to confront the Americans. Later records would confirm that at least two black men volunteered to join that expedition. To make the force look more formidable, the militiamen were issued with the British red uniform to disguise them as regular soldiers. Most of Brock's force rowed and sailed across Lake Erie in a flotilla of small boats. While the Brock's boats crossed the lake, the Americans abandoned Sandwich because they lacked the supplies necessary to maintain their army in the field. Brock revised his plan and decided to attack the Americans in their fort at Detroit. The Americans in the fort surrendered after a cannon barrage. The British Army and their indigenous warriors did not engage the Americans and suffered no casualties. A large quantity of arms and supplies were captured and prize money, money was awarded to the battle veterans after the war. On August 16, 1812, Privates James Baker and Richard Collins were at the capture of Detroit. In Captain Stephen Hewart's detachment of men from the 1st and 3rd York militias, and after the war, were recorded as black men on the Detroit prize money list. This is an example of how a later document revealed a veteran as being black. James Baker later joined the Colored Corps in Niagara. I made the assumption here that he was the same James Baker on the prize money list. Richard Collins was a black private in the 3rd York militia that was mustered from the area around the town of York. In the fall of 1812, Private Richard Pierpoint proposed the formation of a segregated black company. It should be noted that Richard at this time when is in his, in his mid sixties and could have claimed an age exception from service. The formation of a special black company called the Colored Corps was approved and British officers were selected to command it. There was no record of black segregated service in Upper Canada prior to the formation of the Colored Corps. Captain Robert Runchy Sr. was the first commanding officer. Some of the sergeants and all of the lower ranks were colored. I've seen no record of a black officer during, serving during this war. The Corps never obtained enough men to be considered a full company and was therefore an unattractive commission for a British officer. Richard has been portrayed in this image he, in what may have been the Corps uniform in 1812. The men laid, may later have worn white fatigues when they served in the British com Commissariat that supplied the British Army, and also when they became the Artificers Corps. The change in the name of the Corps and assignments suggested the British Army was not sure what to do with this small unit. At about that time, Sergeant William Thompson and 13 other black men were transferred from the 3rd York Militia stationed in the town of York to the Colored Corps on the Niagara frontier. Unfortunately, this report did not list the names of those veterans. Seven of those men have not yet been identified, but the other five men were probably John Call and his brothers Richard and Stephen, Richard Collins, the Detroit Volunteer, and John Sanders. Privates William Grote and James Long remained with the Third York. You can see here that variations in the spelling of the call surname made it difficult to associate records with a particular man. However, spelling variations were common at that time. On October 13, 1812, the Americans invaded across the Niagara River in 13 bateaux and landed just upriver from Queenston, attacked the village, and then scaled the heights above the town. The yellow arrow on this map shows the location of the village of Queenston. The red circle indicates the British forces defending the village and the blue arrow, the American landing site. The larger blue circle on the left indicates the location of the American forces later on top of the heights. Most of the American force never crossed the river. Brock had thought the Queenston attack was a diversion for an attack on Fort George downriver. He arrived from the fort by himself to assess the situation and discovered a major invasion in progress. Brock sent a rider to Fort George to order General Schaaf to march the British Army to Queenston. Brock attempted to scale the heights with a small force 
and was shot by an American standing partly up the escarpment. The colored corps at Fort George was commanded that day by Lieutenant George Runchy and was among the last groups to leave Fort Queen, the fort for Queenston. Captain Runchy was believed to have been ill at that time and resigned his commission after the battle. Robert Malcolmson's research revealed that when General Schaefer marched the British regulars towards Queenston, the army was followed by the Upper Canada Militia and the Coloured Corps. Rather than trying to scale the steep side of the heights like Brock had, Schaefer marched his army around to the south side where there was an open field on a gentle slope up to the American position. The green arrow here on the left of this map indicates the location of the Indigenous forces. The red arrows at the bottom indicate the position of most of the British and the militia and 38 men of the Colored Corps on the British west flank on the heights. The American force was low on munitions and only fired one volley at the British before raising a white flag to surrender. At the end of 1812, the Corps was attached to the Quartermaster General's Department under the command of Captain George Fowler of the British 41st Regiment. At times in 1813, the Corps was also recorded as the Artificers Corps. It's quite likely that British regiments stationed in the colonies contain black recruits. There's one regiment in which we can confirm their presence. The 104th Regiment was recruited from Scotland, England, Ireland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Lower Canada, and in York and Kingston in Upper Canada. As this regiment was recruited from the Atlantic colonies, which had received thousands of Black loyalists, one would expect that some of the men must have been recruited as well. The regiment initially included about 1,000 men. The regiment was to have one private in each company who was appointed as a pioneer and who was trained to build and clear minor obstacles, clear routes, and do other heavy work, and was to have been equipped with bill hooks, spades, picks, felling and broad axes, saws, and, and mattocks. Generally, the pioneers were black. Unfortunately, there are no known surviving regimental records of who those black men were in the 104th. On February 16, 1813, 570 men of the 104th Regiment of Foot left Fredericton, New Brunswick, marching in snowshoes shoes while pulling toboggans and arrived in Quebec City on March 15th. Lieutenant John Le Couture in his journal recorded the company included Private George Lawrence, a black bass drummer in the regimental band. John reported that George had been pulling the bass drum and other supplies on a toboggan and took advantage of a snow covered slope to sit on the drum, slide down the hill. Unfortunately, this made the load top heavy and the toboggan chose its own path down the hill and dumped George in the snow on the way down. After a few days rest in Quebec, the regiment then marched to Kingston. This was the longest march by a British regiment up to that time. By May, about an additional 430 men had joined them at Kingston, where they crossed over Lake Ontario to attack the American naval base at Sackett's Harbour. About a third of the 104th men were killed during that fail failed raid. For the remainder of the war, the regiment served and fought on the Niagara frontier. Solomon Albert and Charles Faulkner were later recorded as black veterans of this regiment. The only surviving payroll for the Colored Corps was for the second quarter of 1813 from April 25th to July 24th. This role was certified on December 27th, 1813 by Lieutenant James Robertson who was later commanding the Corps that December. Militia roles rarely recorded where the men were stationed or what they were doing, but an examination of the remarks in the right-hand column on this role reveal a number of interesting details. During this quarter, the Corps was commanded by Captain George Fowler with Lieutenant George Runchy, who was on parole from the Americans after it had been captured in May. The terms of the parole were that George could not bear arms against the Americans, 
but could otherwise serve with the British. Sergeant John Colley had been transferred from the British 8th Regiment. We do not know if John Colley or Edward Gout were black, but Sergeant James Waters, the brother of Humphrey Waters, and Corporals Isaac Lee and William Thomas were black. The 33 black privates each received a pay of six pence, which was a half shilling per day, the regular rate of pay for an Upper Canada militia private. The right-hand column indicated remarks about some of the men. John Jackson was absent without leave in May. John Montgomery joined the Corps in May. Two men deserted on May 27th, either during or after the battle at Fort George. Anthony Hutz was taken prisoner during that battle. Four deserted in June. Three were sick in the hospital, but still receiving pay. And James Steinberg was employed in the King's Works. These were all typical remarks found on militia rolls from the Niagara frontier. What was, else was happening between April and July? On April 27, 1813, the Americans landed at York, captured the town and held it for three days before departing to capture Fort George at Niagara. No surviving militia rolls have been found for this event. About 500 militia men were stationed on the British right flank on Queen Street and never engaged the Americans. A much smaller number of militiamen found themselves engaged with the Americans, but it was not known where they were stationed. Lieutenant Eli Plater and his detachment arrived at the fort minutes before the British retreat to Kingston. Militia le leaders surrendered the town of York. No rock records have been discovered for black veterans at that battle. After leaving the town of York, the American fleet proceeded to the town of Niagara. On May 27, 1813, 27 men of the Colored Corps were among the companies who tried to oppose the American landing at Captain James Crook's farm at the Two Mile Creek. Men from the Glengarry Light Infantry the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, the British 8th Regiment, about 100 Michelin men, and the Colored Corps created a force of 310 men that were showered with heavy gunfire from the American ships and were forced to retreat. As the Americans landed, the British force charged forward twice, but again were repelled. No record of the casualties has been discovered. An American report recorded that one black member of the Glengarry Light Infantry was killed. The British retreated to Burlington Heights and left the Americans in control of the Niagara Peninsula. On May 29, 1813, there were 30 men, including officers in the, color, in the Corps of Artificers, which were part of Brigadier General Vincent's retreating army. The British retained the services of the Corps while other militia units were sent home. The expectation was that the British Army would have to retreat all the way to Kingston. On May 31st, 1813, the artificers were probably building defensive works on Richard Beasley's farm on top of Burlington Heights, which later became the main supply depot for the Niagara Peninsula. On June 3rd, 1813, roll of troops in contaminants at the head of Burlington Bay reported the Corps consisted of one captain, three sergeants, 29 rank and file fit for duty and one man sick. On June 4th, 1813, the black artificers were recorded again with the British Army. A number of militiamen, particularly officers, fearing being imprisoned by the Americans, volunteered to remain with the British as well. The American Army pursued the retreating army to Stony Creek where the Americans camped on June 5th, 1813. The British occupied a fortified position on Burlington Heights to the north and were preparing for a further retreat to the town of York. The American camp had not been set, strategically set up, and that intelligence was passed to the British, who saw an opportunity for a night attack. A select force attacked the American camp at night and forced them to flee back to the Niagara area. Although the Colored Corps was with the Army, no record has been found of any Black veterans at that battle. The Americans occupied the Niagara Peninsula until December, while the British were encamped at Burlington Heights, where the large red circle is on this map. 
They had scouting parties and pickets in the field as far as St. David's and DeCow's house on top of the escarpment. Sometime after July 11, 1813, the Corps was under the command of Lieutenant James Robertson, formerly of the Provincial Artificers. On August 22nd, 1813, during the blockade of Fort George, the unit was at St. David's, where the small red circle is on the far right side of the map, with 26 rank and file. The Corps was not recorded again until the following summer. In October 1813, a small detachment of the 2nd York Militia, mustered from the Burlington area, was recorded doing road work on Dundas Street. Among the crew was Michael Grope, a former African slave of loyalist William Davis from North Carolina. With Michael was his son William, a mixed race Tuscarora warrior. Michael's other son, Henry, was not serving that day, but was recorded in the same regiment. In 2010, when I had tra transcribed the Second York Militia Rolls from the war, I found no evidence that any of these veterans were Black. A few years later, Jerry Prager contacted me and told me that Michael was one of his Black ancestors. On December 10, 1813, the Americans burned all but three houses in the town of Niagara and retreated back across the Niagara River. As there was a black community living in the town, it is quite likely, likely that those families lost their homes and possessions as well, but the 1816 war loss claims did not always identify the claimants by color. A number of upper Canadian families suffered losses to the Americans during the occupation of the Niagara frontier. The inhabitants first made claims for compensation in 1816. Three of the claims were made by men identified as black militiamen. Corporal Robert Jupiter made a war loss claim for items taken from Mary Jupiter by the Americans in 1813. Clarissa Waters, the wife of James Waters, certified that claim. The items included a pair of horses, a set of harness, a large sleigh for hauling lumber, three hogs, and bedding and furniture. Robert was a former slave of the Fort service family of Niagara. Private William Mandigo had lost a horse taken by the Americans. Corporal Humphrey Waters had two horses taken and crops destroyed. In 1809, Humphrey had married Catherine Service, a European woman. The American and British armies both suffered from shortages of, of horses, wagons and sleighs, and other supplies. The losses reported here were common items taken by both sides during the war. At times, receipts were given exchange, but these were difficult to cash because of a shortage of money. In 1816, the value of the total claims was three times the annual income of the province, and the government did not have the money to pay them at that time. Payment was deferred until 1823, when the government, with assistance from the British, paid half the value of each claim. Although we know the Colored Corps was stationed on the Niagara frontier in 1814, I have been unable to find documented proof that they took part in any of the American engagements that year. S three surviving records indicated that about 54 Black veterans served in the Corps during the length of the war. The 104th Regiment of Foot was at Lundy's Lane and later at the Battle at Fort Erie, but I have no records of the involvement of Black veterans there. At least five black men served in this regiment during the war, and at least two of them were discharged in Upper Canada in 1815. This was the last year of combat on the Niagara frontier. In February 1814, the Loyal and Patriotic Society granted Catherine Waters, a white woman, the wife of Humphrey Waters, who had lost almost all her clothes to the Americans at Humphreys, crop on land he rented on Mrs. Thomas Butler's farm, the sum of $25 to be occasionally given as needed by the Reverend Addison of St. Mark's Church in Niagara. Catherine had three and her three children had been driven from the farm and were robbed and were left poor. The Americans had set up an outpost at Thomas Butler's farm in June of 1813, and this was probably when Catherine was evicted. 
On June 27, 1814, the abstract, a weekly distribution return of the Wright Division, Major General Ryle, headquarters, Fort George, reported that the Color Corps was stationed at Fort George and dependencies and consisted of one officer, two sergeants, 20 rack and file with four men sick. These reports indicated that the Corps was in continuous service while local militia regiments served intermittently. In 1814, the Colored Corps began the construction of Fort Mississauga west of the town of Niagara to defend the area against another American invasion. The fort would not be completed until 1816. On July 8, 1814, a distribution return for Fort Mississauga recorded the Colored Corps stationed there included one officer, two sergeants, one drummer, 22 rank and file, with four men sick. This chart shows changes in the strength of the Corps from eight reports. There was a gradual loss of men due to deaths, illnesses, and desertions. On March 24th, 1815, the Corps was discharged. At the time of their discharge, each man received six months additional pay. A private would have received 90 shillings. That was about a week's pay for a laborer. On July 16, 1814, the widow Lee, a black woman, suffered the following losses to the Americans. Two bedspreads, one blanket, three shirts, two coats, two jackets, a brass candlestick, a bed tick, a tea kettle, an iron pot, and crockery ware. This event took place sometime between the Battle of Chippewa and Lundy's Lane that July on the Niagara Peninsula. On December 24th, 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed by representatives of Britain and the United States agreeing on the terms to end the war. King George IV signed the treaty on behalf of Britain. On February 16th, 1815, President Madison signed the treaty on behalf of the United States. It would come in effect the following day. Borders between the countries were to remain the same as they were in June 1812 when war was declared. In February 1815, Sarah Long's pair of horses and sleigh were impressed by the Royal Scots Regiment to transport military baggage from York to Queenston. She claimed that her mare had died of fatigue during the journey. Lieutenant Eli Plater certified that he had seen the carcass of the dead horse on the side of the road and recognized it as Sarah's. Early in the war, Sarah had lost boards and fencing from her home in the town of York to British soldiers stationed there. Having a house, a sleigh, and a team of horses suggested that Sarah and her family were prospering in the town. Pensions were paid to widows, disabled veterans, and those caring for veterans' orphans. Some of those lists have survived, and at least two black widows received a pension. On February 23rd, 1813, a private John Jackson died of an illness and was survived by his wife, Margaret. On January 1st, 1817, Private Peter Lee died of an illness as a result of the war, and his wife, Mary, later received a widow's pension. In 1819, a number of orders in council from the Upper Canada Assembly granted land to members of the Colored Corps and other Black veterans. Some of these men received land grants in Oral and Sunnydale townships in Simcoe County, north of the town of York, where the red circle is on this map. This map shows the townships of Sunnydale and Oral in red outlines. Most militia veterans were already well settled elsewhere and did not want to move and start over. They abandoned their granted locations or hired agents to improve their land and then sold the title. These men included black veterans of the war in 1812 who served in the Color Corps and other regiments. In 1819, James and John Long, the sons of Peter and Sarah, who had served in the 3rd and 1st York militias, respectively during the war, applied for land grants, received the Monoro Township, but never settled on the land there. 
Both sons had done routine duties at Fort York during the war and may have served during the American capture of the town of York in April, on April 27, 1813. They were still living in the town of York in 1822 with their mother and brother David. Between 1819 and 1826, Oral Township's lands were granted, granted to 23 black men on Wilberforce Street, but only seven were members of the Color Corps and only six veterans actually settled there. The black areas on this map show the Color Corps veterans' land and three other probable veterans who remained on the land and later received patents. The blue line is Wilberforce Street and the red line is the Penetanguishun Road. I will return to these veteran grants in a moment. On October 21st, 1820, a list of black veterans of the Corps who served in the last quarter of 1812 under Captain Robert Runchy was prepared to verify who was eligible for a grant. We recorded who had died since 1812, where the men lived in 1820, and a few other details. Fourteen of the 34 black men had died since 1812. The other 20 were living in four areas, Bay of Quint, Burlington, York, and the Niagara Peninsula. Note that about half the men were living on the Niagara Peninsula, all were living at least a two-day journey away from the Oral Township land grants. There was a second role from this time period for the black veterans who had served after 1812 under Lieutenant James Robertson, with an additional five men on that role, but it did not record where the men were living. In 1820, the militia land grants promised other the other men who had served in special units, the grants were made available. Among these grants were also claims made by members of the Colored Corps. As some men more than, made more than one claim, it was not unusual to find their names in both the 1819 Orders in Council for Black Veterans and the 1820 Militia Land Grants. In the Militia Grant Register, I found Humphrey Waters, a farmer in the town of Niagara who claimed a grant as a former corporal in the Cullen Corps and was granted 100 acres in Oral Township. In fine print on the right, bottom right-hand corner, it was noted that John DeLay received title to this land in 1821. This was a clerical error that later had to be resolved through legislation. Humphrey never lived on this land, but his tenants would develop the land for him so that his son could later claim title. After receiving a land grant on, on Wilberforce Street, all settlers were required to clear a minimal amount of land build a cabin, cultivate a minimal amount of land, and clear the road allowance. They could then claim the patent, which was the title, to the land. Ten probable veterans were living in Upper Canada during the war, received locations, but either did not settle on the land or did not complete the land duties, and therefore did not receive the title. As you can see from this list of Black veterans who did not stay on the land, included veterans of the 104th Regiment of Foot, the Colored Corps, and the 1st and 3rd York Militias. Four men were living in Upper Canada, where militia service was compulsory for most men during the war, but no war service records have been found for them yet. This is a list of the probable, blank, not, probable nine Black veterans who did stay on their locations and who did obtain their patents. Note that only six of the, those men were veterans of the Colored Corps. That was six veterans out of a possible 39 who were still living in 1820. The Weber Force settlement created for War of 1812 veterans was not success, successful in enticing those veterans to settle in Oro Township. The remainder of the first wave black settlers in Oro Township arrived in Upper Canada after the War of 1812 and were therefore not veterans. In 2018, I indexed the number of War of 1812 militia veterans who received land grants in the neighboring townships of South and North Aurelia. There were 14, 14 grants in those townships, but only two men actually settled on their land. This is a similar percentage to those who remained in Oro Township. This implied that most militia veterans, whether Black or European, were not willing to move and resettle, and that the quality of land was not a factor in their decision. 
The Wilberforce settlement eventually was eventually successful in creating a black community. This map shows the locations of all the black homesteads in Arnold Township. The blue arrow again points to Wilberforce Street, which was the first area of settlement. Later settlement was in the area around the Orth Oro African Church. I have compiled a probable history here for the color corps and other black veterans. Ambiguities and discrepancies between histories highlight the need for further research. Well, I hope that as you may have gained some insights into the black experience of the War of 1812 and the Wilberforce Street Black Veteran Settlement. I also hope that some of you may be able to contribute to this history in the future. You may also be interested in reading some, one or more of the Wilberforce Street Settlement histories in this image. The two on the right can be purchased from the museum. Fred, you've done some remarkable research. Could you comment on the sources you explored and relied on to tell this story? And likewise, with your local pioneer research on Thursday mornings. Um, I began the War of 1812 research in 2010 uh, by first um, looking at a collection of militia roles for the Second York Militia. And from those roles, I recorded all the, the different names. So I ended up with about 700 names for a regiment with, that any one time would have included about 550 men. So because there were 700 overall, that shows that men were coming and going all the time. Uh, from that, uh, I then started looking for family histories to find out more about these men. And then later I transcribed the uh, some of the uh, militia land grants after the war, and I transcribe um, an index for the war loss claims in 1816. And from those documents, I had more family history for that first regiment that I had uh, researched. And then it's, it was a gradually a buildup of finding documents like uh, the annual report for the Loyalist Society, which gave out aid to veterans. Um, and other collections of documents. And um, the, gradually I built up a, a, a collection of, of sources, which was the hardest part, finding those sources. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Colleen who says, thank you for the presentation, Fred. I believe there is an historical black church in Coldwater. Do you know anything about this church or... Uh, any connection to your presentation? That That is the Oro African Church. In Coldwater? No. It's in Oro Township. Okay. It's close to Coldwater. But I have no history of a Black uh, church in Coldwater. There may have been one, but I've never heard of it. Okay. Um, Jay says, in your research, did you come across why Oro was chosen as the location for these Black soldiers to settle was it randomly selected or was there a specific uh reason uh i also was wondering this okay we have to go back to the american revolution when the loyalists came north the british thought it would be a great idea to put all these military veterans and settle them uh, at strategic military locations so they settled them along the north shore of the saint lawrence they settled them in the Niagara area because those were the easiest access points for the Americans if they decided to invade. So it was a defensive decision. And when we come to Lake Simcoe, there are a number of routes between Lake Simcoe and Lake Huron. And the Americans, uh, the British were very concerned that, that they want to keep the Americans out of the Lake Huron area. So they want easy access. If uh, like in 1813, the British lost control of Lake Ontario, and that was their trade route, main trade route. So they had these backup plans for Lake Simcoe. So the first one was the uh, the portage from Kempenfelt Bay to um, the Nottawasaga River. The next one was the Shanty Bay area where we have the Penetang Road. There was a road, a military road built from Pen from Lake Simcoe to Penetang. Now. 
when they look at, at, at settling people, they're looking again at that Penetang Road and they want to defend it. So the natural idea was let's put former military people on that road. Let's settle them there. And then if there's ever an American invasion and we want to defend that road, the people are already living there. We don't have to march an army north. So that it was a defensive reason. Interesting. Uh, and Jay says, very interesting. Thanks, Fred. Um, we have a question here asking you to clarify, were Chief Joseph Brandt's slaves Black or Indigenous? We don't know. Uh, but like I, like I, I found in my research, he was one of the major slaveholders. Mm -hmm. When he came into Canada, uh, a number of those slaves were freed over time, and I, I expect most of them were adopted into the, tri the tribe. It appears mm -hmm. Mike Grote was because his wife, he married a Tuscarora woman. Fascinating. Um, Norman asks, was Wilberforce Street renamed? Is it now the third concession? I don't know. I've been looking at old maps. Uh, I, 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 I think he's probably, um, yeah, it would be on the third concession. Yeah. Nice, Norman. Um, we have an interesting comment here from Ian that says, uh, thank you for the presentation. My daughter and I did some research on the Hartwell family who bought John Call's land. I grew up on lot 22 on Wilberforce Street slash line one. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Ian. Um, Susan says, amazing research. Thanks for sharing. Where are all these original records uh, held where you got your details? Are they with uh, the Fort or Ontario Archives? Uh, most are in uh, Collections Canada in Ottawa. Um, I do have a research guide, which uh, is one of the things that's available through the museum. If, if you email the museum and ask for Fred's War of 1812 Research Guide. Uh, there, there's uh, about 50 pages of information where to find the documents, uh, how to interpret what you're reading, and uh, what it will and will not tell you. Great. Um, Bruce asks, as I recall, there's a list of names engraved on the monument at the Oro African Church. Do any of these names match your research of Black veterans from 1812? I, I don't know. I, I, I sort of uh, stopped my research before the church was built. Right. So I, I've not looked at the monument. Uh, during the presentation, there were the six men who actually settled on the land. Those were the six men that uh, I would look for on the monument. Okay. Um, and we've, we have a few more questions coming in here, Fred. Um, uh, Dave asks, how long was there a Black presence in the Oro community? Uh, again, uh, I would advise you to read one of the books on the, the Black Oro settlement because my research sort of ends uh, before 1830. Right. I've got the I've got all my 1812 veterans on the land by 1830. So I, I, I have looked at some of the other families, but that's where my War of 1812 research ended. Mm -hmm. I do have notes on some of the other families and some family histories, but um, it's mostly from the uh, the books that are that the museum has. Right. Um, we have a few comments coming in here. Um, John says my third. Uh, GGF, great-grandfather, uh, while not a veteran, he was awarded a grant in the Wilberforce settlement but did not settle there. Um, and then another Dave says, Wilberforce Street was the first concession, 100-acre lots for black settlers. White settlers on the Penetang Road were 200 acres. And the black settlement later moved around the church on the third concession during the second wave of black settlers. So some very knowledgeable people in the crowd mm -hmm. tonight. Oh, we have uh, Catherine who uh, says, um, in leisure time, what do we know about the activities that took place in settlement communities such as Wilberforce? Music, art, literature, community, family events. Do you know anything about this, Fred? Um, there is a book that 
may tell you more about that, but I don't have the name of it. And it's not one I would look at because like I say, my, my research only went up to about 1830, but mm -hmm. yeah, there, there was uh, one of the neighbors wrote a book. Um, somebody at the museum would probably be able to tell you the name of the book. Um, so culturally, no, I wouldn't know much. Okay. Um, and I have one final question here from Bruce. Um, firstly, he says, thanks for the wonderful presentation. And he says, what was the size of the land grants to those who arrived through the Underground Railroad or as veterans? Um, a militia land grant for a private was 100 acres. That was promised in 1812. Uh, as your rank got higher, you got uh, more acreage. So if you were an ensign, you would have, I think it's an ensign got 500 acres, but the, like I said before, the, the black veterans uh, were not officers. So most of them got a 100 acre uh, lot. Some, if they were sergeants, would have got a 200 acre lot. Um, but Wilberforce Strait, when it was surveyed, when they were looking at those lots, they decided beforehand that they would be 100 acre lots just because that fit the promise in 1812 for a 100-acre lot so that everywhere else, the privates got half a lot because the lots were 200. But on Wilberforce Street, they, they planned that when they did the survey, that this is what the way it was, that that's why it was surveyed with 100-acre lots. Uh, everywhere else, uh, the men got, if they, if they were entitled to 100 acres, they got half of a 200-acre lot. I see. Um, and we had, uh, um, we did have one final comment come in there from Valerie saying she learned a ton. Uh, so thanks for the great presentation, Fred. Um, so we're going to uh, wrap up our Q&A period there. Fred, thank you again. Mm -hmm.